you would turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, today I want to talk to you about a worthy walk, a worthy walk. Got a new friend here today, Kat, sitting by Ben, Mariner High School student. Sorry to embarrass you, Kat, but you're glad you're here. You're welcome anytime. Um, a worthy walk. I just want to read the passage, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. The Bible says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in the manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the Ephesians. He says, With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you are called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Now, in life, uh, anytime you become part of an organization, there's going to be certain obligations that you have to fulfill. And many of you have been in those type of situations. Uh, like if you're on a sports team, you get chosen to be on the team, you earn the place on the team. Uh, you also have certain obligations that you have to fulfill. You have to listen to the coach, follow the rules of the coach. You have to play the game. You have to be there. There's obligations to being on the team. And there's all kinds of uh, other examples for that. If you're a citizen in a country, um, you have certain responsibilities that you have to follow and fulfill as a citizen of a country. Any social group. But all other kinds of groups. There's, there are expected things of you. And another also is that you can't bring any dishonor to the group as well if you're in it. Uh, you're not supposed to bring any kind of shame or embarrassment to the group that you're in. Well, when you become a Christian, a child of God, and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you become part of God's family, you're part of God's church, Christ's body, there are also obligations to that position. And the Apostle Paul, he's already dealt with Ephesians chapter 1 through 3. Uh, God reveals his plan of how he is going to um, gather together a people, a chosen people. And in chapters 1 through 3, he talks about how this plan is, is lived out within history and how through Jesus Christ's death for sinners that God and his resurrection from the dead, that God created something that the world has never seen. And this is on your outline. Not just a new life for individuals, but a new society. Many times we don't think about what the church is, what Christianity is. What really actually is going on here is that what Paul told us in chapters 1 through 3, how, how there's this alienated humanity uh, is being reconciled to God. Most people don't think about it, but people are the enemy of God because of their sin and the wrath that they have to fear is wrath from him. It's from him because of their sin. And people are alienated from God. And also they're divided. Humanity is divided uh, from each other. So what God did through Jesus Christ is he reconciled us to God. He reconciled him, us to himself and he also united Mankind together are, are a certain group of people, the church, which many times he talks about Jews and Gentiles. It's a really a magnificent plan. It's a new society with new people in it, born-again people, 
People that are not like the world, they are separate from the world because of what God has done in them. That's the church. That's the body of Christ. Now here in Ephesians 4, uh, Paul moves from God's creation of this new society, the church, the body, a new creation of people that are born again believers in Jesus Christ. He moves from this concept of a new society to telling us the new standards expected of this new society. That's really what he's talking about here in Ephesians. God saved us, now there's standards. We're new creatures in this new society. We're new citizens in a new society. Now we have new standards to live by, unlike the world. And he urges us, the Apostle Paul's writing, and he urges us to have a worthy walk. A worthy walk. He says, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord. Uh, he, he's a prisoner in Rome because of his devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot I could say about that, but I'm not. I'm not going to go into those details. But he's in prison because of his devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul never would say, you know, I'm in prison uh, by the Romans. He wouldn't say that. He, his perspective was whatever was happening to him, he was doing it for God. He was doing it for the Lord. So he says, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. And he's not trying to get sympathy from his readers. He's just simply trying to add force to his request. He says, therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, I'm a prisoner and I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to go to prison for what I'm asking you to do. I'm willing to go to prison. I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. You've been called to Christianity. You've been drawn by God to Christ. You've been called. You've had an effectual call in your spirit to come to God. And he says, I want you to walk worthy of that calling. Uh, and I believe, he's saying, I believe this so strongly, I'll even go to prison for it. That you walk, have a worthy walk. Now the word walk, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, means your daily conduct. That's what he's talking about. A worthy walk, to walk worthy of. It means your daily conduct. And the Apostle Paul is simply telling the readers that they need to live uh, in a manner that's worthy of their calling. Uh, now you're a Christian, act like it. Live like it. And he says, therefore. Now the reason he said therefore is because uh, of all the doctrine that he's already taught them in, in chapters 1 through 3. He says, now therefore, now then, since all that's true, now then... You need to live what you know. Therefore, I implore you to walk in a manner worthy. Guys, your behavior comes from your belief. Don't tell me you believe in being a, a pure person if you're not pure. You don't really believe that. Don't, don't tell me you believe in being a gracious, giving person when you are not gracious and you're not giving. Your behavior always comes from your belief. What you really believe, you do. And if you don't really believe it, then you don't do it. And Paul is saying, you're a Christian and you know all the doctrine. I've taught you about what God has done for you. Now you need to live it. Therefore, I implore you to walk in a manner worthy. Now, I've broken these six verses up into three parts. Uh, verses one is the urging for a worthy walk. And I'll talk about that for like 45 minutes. And then, uh, I'm just kidding. Thank you for that giggle, Cindy. <clears throat> Number two, the understanding of a worthy walk. Paul explains what that is. That's in verse two and three. And then the unity 
of a worthy walk is in verse 4 and 6. And I've decided not to cover those two verses because I believe they need a little bit more time. So I'll just do the first two points today. Uh, The urging for a worthy walk. Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you, implore you. Now, this is not a command which the Apostle Paul could have done. He could have made it an imperative, and he would have said, this is a command. But that's not what he's doing here. He is, it's a plea. It's a plea. Some commentators said that he's begging them uh, for them to do what is right. He, He didn't want them to be saved. He doesn't want them to be Christians, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and then stay the same way that they have always been. He's saying, I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. So he's just, he's saying, don't stay the same. Now this phrase here, to walk worthy, has the idea of balancing scales. To walk worthy, balancing scales. Uh, What is on one side of the scale should be equal weight on the other side of the scale. So walk worthy is a balancing of scales. For a Christian, what that means is that your practical living should match your spiritual position. You're a child of God and you've been given eternal life by grace. You're in a position that quite frankly, very few people in the world are in. Very, very, very few people are in the position that you're in. If you're a child of God, if you've been saved by grace, if you've been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ, and you have the Holy Spirit indwelling in you, I'm going to tell you something, guys. There's not very many people in this town in that position. And you run, a, you run into them all the time. And Paul's saying that your practical living, the way you live, ought to match your spiritual position. You're a Christian. You're a child of God. You have eternal life. You have eternal security. You are special in the eyes of God. You're part of a family. I like that. I'm part of God's family. That's why every once in a while when I talk to you, If I get the sense that you're part of God's family, I'm going to call you brother, sister, affectionately. I have to call Bill Taylor grandpa or something, but uh, amen, brother. Wear that title proudly. But we're family. We're in this position, and Paul is just simply saying, act like it. And he says, I implore you, I urge you. He, it's begging. I mean, come on. He's like, come on. That's what he's saying. Come on. Let's, let's do this. And the Apostle Paul, he wants them to live godly. By the way, guys, every minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, every loving minister of God, pleads for the believers to live faithful walks for God. Every minister does that. I mean, you find a pastor that doesn't even care if the people that he's the pastor of live godly, that's a problem. And from time to time, he ought to beg you to do it. And say, please, You're a child of God. Live like it. Act like it. So that's what Paul is doing here. By the way, you have a part of your sanctification. You do. Um, The Bible clearly tells us to discipline ourselves unto godliness. Discipline ourselves. Uh, And you've heard me say before, uh, there's a lot of people that discipline their bodies. You know, they're weight lifting. And and, and again, I'm not in any way criticizing that. I've told you before, if if I ever have trouble, I'm going to come to somebody who 
is big and strong and, and can help me. Why would I want to go to some scrawny, skinny person? But, uh, you know, they're not going to help at all. But, but God wants us to discipline our spirit for purity and for godly living. And we have a part in that. That's sanctification. Now, the Holy Spirit is the one who ultimately does the work, but we do have a part in it to discipline ourselves for godliness. And Paul is pleading for that. And then he goes on in verses 2 and 3. He starts talking to us about the understanding of a worthy walk. Because, okay, you're telling me to walk worthy. Now help me understand what that means. What is a, and I don't believe that the things that I'm going to talk about here in this passage are a complete list of the things that a person should do in order to have a worthy walk. But they are what Paul starts with. So the understanding of a worthy walk, and he's explaining to these believers the standards of Christianity, the standards of being in a church, the standards of being in a Christian family, the standards of being in a new society that's been set apart from an ungodly, heathen, pagan world. These are the standards. And he starts out, he says, with all humility. So walk worthy of the manner of the calling with which you've been called with all humility. Now literally that means lowliness of mind. It means that you don't think too highly of yourself. And the reason why I say too highly is because you don't want to Go around having fake humility, saying, I'm no good, I can't do anything, I'm worthless, I have no talents or skills or abilities, I'm so unnecessary for the world. That's fake humility. You don't want to have, you don't want to think too highly of yourself. That's humility. And it's foundational of the Christian life. I don't think you can be saved without this type of humility. Uh, and it occurs in people's lives when they understand they are mere created beings. Did y'all know that about yourself? You're, you're just a mere created being. You, you did not yourself create the universe. <laughs> and you didn't even create yourself. Did you? I'd like to know the science on that. You know, there's some people that act like they can just create, a, make themselves a whole different person. I know some people that go around saying, and this is, I'm not kidding you, I'm a cat. That People do that. I'm a dog. They do, you, did you hear they do that, Tony? They go around, they, they, say, they say, I identify as, one guy identified as an Asian. So he literally started shooting Botox into his face and to make him look like an Asian person. I want to tell you what that is. That is the height of arrogance to a sovereign God. For you to say, I'm not going to be what I am. That is the height of arrogance. It's the height of proud pride. And you're not saved. If you go around saying, I'm not what I am. And that's why humility is very important for a Christian. It's where you understand who you are, where you are. You are a mere created being. You have been created by God, and you are 100% dependent on Him. One, not 99. You're 100% on Him. You're not a big shot. I don't care what you've accomplished, what you've done, what level of education you have, or any, name it. Name the accomplishment. It doesn't matter. You're not a big shot. You know what the Bible calls you? Dust. Dust. And as my one of my favorite commentators said, it's not gold dust either. 
humility. Ecclesiastes 3.20 says, All came from dust and all are going to return to dust. You know, and Christians understand that. Believers understand that. People who have actually met God and have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, it's clear to us that we're nothing without Him. And pride causes problems in a church. And this is one of the reasons why Paul is bringing this up. Humility is essential to the unity in a church. And remember, Paul is writing to a church. And he's saying, he's saying you need to walk worthy of the calling in which you've been called, and, and you need to be humble because humility unites a church family. Pride causes division and disharmony. Would you agree with that? It does. Anytime you see problems and issues and difficulties going on in the church, it's because somebody's being prideful. Somebody is being prideful. Humility is the friend of unity. I mean, just think about it. Who do you get along with better? A person who respects you for who you are or somebody who looks down on you and thinks they're better than you? Who do you get along with better? Right? So if we're going to have unity in our church, we have to be humble. We have to be humble. We can't be prideful. We can't think that one person's better than another. Uh, and that's why Paul is bringing these things up. Humility promotes unity. And by the way, and I know most of you in here know this, but you know, all of us are at different phases within our Christian life. We're at different ages. Um. You know, I've been a Christian for 35 years now, so you would hope that I've learned some things, maybe that somebody who's only been a Christian for a month or a year, they haven't learned that yet, right? So humility comes in and is very important when the mature Christians understand that, hey, I used to be like that. I used to be a young Christian that made all these weird little decisions that, that were not proper. Like little kids, you know, they pick their boogers and eat it. I don't do that anymore. I don't, yeah, thank you, it is, isn't it? It just came to me. You know, but young Christians do all kinds of things that older Christians don't do. Guess what? The older Christians need to be humble when they're dealing with them. Because quite frankly, we're all a bunch of created beings made of dust and we're totally 100% dependent on God. And God has saved our soul, but he's got a mission for us to go out into the world, present Christ to the world. And we need to stick together when we're doing that. Mature Christians, baby Christians. Humility, he says. Also gentleness. Gentleness. Uh, this is just meekness or, or mildness. Uh, gentleness involves the absence of a spirit of resentment or revenge. That's what gentleness, gentleness is. It is the absence of a spirit of resentment or revenge. No, you don't, you don't retaliate. You don't retaliate. Now, it doesn't mean you're weak when you're gentle. It does not mean you're a weak person. Um, but, it, but it means that the power that you have, which, by the way, all of us in here have power. I mean, I have the power to mess up your day if I want to. I do, and you have it also. All you have to do is say uh, to me after the service, you can say, Pastor Ron, your message stunk. You know, that would hurt me tremendously. You have the power to affect people with your words and the way you treat them. We have tremendous power, actually. We can mess up a bunch of people's day if we want to. 
That's the kind of power that you have. And some of you even have more than that. You're in positions of power where you can affect somebody's life. So you have power, but the gentle person is not a weak person, but that gentle person puts all of his power under God. And all of his strength and all of his authority, he wants to put under the control of God. And believe, you know, really, believers are more interested in helping people than hurting people. Would you agree with that? Uh, believers are more interested in using their strength and their ability and their authority or whatever power they have in order to help somebody. And they want to come alongside someone. That's what the heart of Jesus is to come alongside someone and say, how am I going to help you through this? In gentleness. Now guys, humility and gentleness are virtues that the world know nothing about. They don't. Uh, and you know, I don't know, guys, have y'all noticed that while the, the town, you know, Cape Coral has grown a lot. And um, I feel like I've been, people have been ruder to me over the last couple of months than they were, you know, a couple of years ago. Have y'all noticed any of that or is it just me? I've been honked at more than I've ever been honked at in my life. You know, and I'm thinking, you know, I gave you plenty of room. What's the problem? You know, I, I didn't pull out in front of you. And they're hon- it's like there's a, a tremendous amount of um, hate or whatever um, going on in this town. Boy, I've got so many examples, but I'm not going to say them. (laughs) But guys, humility and gentleness are virtues the world knows nothing about. The world exalts pride. That's what the world exalts. And uh, believing in yourself. And we tell kids, we tell our little kids that you can be anything that you want to be. It doesn't matter if your IQ is a 10 You can still grow up and be the president of the United States. Guys, those statements are not true, first of all. They're not true. It is not true that anybody can grow up and be anything. That's just not a true statement. You can do that if God has given you the abilities and the intellect and and the talents. Then, Then you have what it takes to do that. But not everybody has that. But our world is so prideful and arrogant that we go around, we even tell our own children that they can be anything that they want to be, and we even then we tell them, go for it. Even if you have to push and shove and cheat a little bit, that's okay. And guys, parents do this. Um, it wasn't real recent, but a while back, you know that the rich people were paying for their kids to get in the best colleges and things. You remember that? You know, why why do people do that kind of stuff? Why does the world tell their kids that kind of stuff and and push them in that way? Well, I'm going to tell you why. Because the worldly society loves to boast. They love to boast. And they love to parade. They love parades. And exalt those who accomplish something. That's what they love. And and there's certainly nothing wrong with exalting somebody who does something noble, right? Or, Or celebrating, recognizing genuine, noble behavior. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Is there anything wrong with that? Yeah, but the things that the world is exalting and parading and and recognizing are not all that noble. Am I making sense? I don't know. All right. You know, the things the world recognizes has little to do or nothing to do with anything of any eternal value. 
The things that the world loves to promote are things like, you know, okay, this person has, has power and, and, you know, brings me great pride. And I'm not going to get into a lot of examples, but truthfully, guys, we, we celebrate so many things, or, and not we, not Christians, but the world celebrates so many things that they ought to be ashamed of. They ought to be ashamed of it. And they're celebrating it. The things the world loves is not Christ-like. And Paul is talking about a worthy walk here. A worthy walk, remember. Something worthy. The world's attitude is very different from the attitude that the Lord Jesus Christ had. The Bible says in Matthew eleven, twenty nine, 29, Jesus said, learn, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. I'm gentle and humble in heart. How do we know that Jesus was really gentle and humble in heart? Well, all you have to do is think about who he is and how he came. First of all, he's the God of the universe. He is the Son of God. He's the literal owner of the universe and the king of the world. And yet when he came, how did he choose to come into this world? See, that tells you humility. That's humility. That is gentleness, meekness. He, he came into the world, not in a castle. Jesus could have been born in a castle. And, but he was born in a stable. He didn't come uh, born into a rich family where we, he could enjoy all of the comforts of, of that day. He came in an extremely poor family. That's how Jesus came. You know, he never owned any property except the clothes on his back. And he was buried in a borrowed tomb. See, Jesus, he's humble and gentle, and yet he had power. <laughs> he could have, at any time he wanted, he could have destroyed all of his enemies, but he didn't. He stayed submitted to the will of his Father in order to seek and to save the lost and give himself, to give himself over. See, that's what we should do. That's what God wants us to do, to be humble and gentle. And I just want to encourage you, don't let the pride that you have and the power that you have get in the way of walking a worthy walk for God. If you're a child of God, you're going to regret doing that. It's just not going to work. So humility, patience, the Apostle Paul, as he's continuing to Help us understand what this worthy walk is. Uh, patience, with patience. So there's humility, there's gentleness. The third one is with patience. Now, sometimes this wor word is translated long-suffering. You know what that means, don't you? It means that a patient person can endure negative circumstances and never give in to them. Now let that sink in for a second. A patient person can endure negative circumstances and never give in to them. They never lose their temper. They're able to suffer a long time and stay cool and calm and Christ-like although they've suffered for a long, long time. Uh, the patient saint accepts God's plan for everything. The patient saint accepts God's plan for everything without questioning or complaining, even when his or her place in life is not easy 
and not as glamorous as the other guy's place in life. Can you relate to that? That's the patient person. Patient. Next, showing tolerance for one another in love. So this is helping us understand what the uh, worthy walk is, showing tolerance for one another in love. In other words, you put up with things that you don't like and you even continue to love the person who is doing what you do not like. That's tolerance. You're not being tolerant if you don't put up with the person and you don't like them anymore when they do things you don't like. That's not tolerance. That's revenge, that's getting even, that's retaliation. But God tells the people, his people, showing tolerance for one another in love. So you put up with things that you don't like and you even continue to love the person who is doing what you do not like. Now, what I'm about to say is very, very important. Um, who do you show that kind of kindness to? Who do you show that kind of tolerance to? Because, you know, the world says it should be showed to everybody. You know, people can just do whatever they want to do, and I have to tolerate it. The Bible does not teach that. Here Paul says showing tolerance for who? One another. He's talking about fellow believers. He's talking about people in the new society, people in the church, people in the body of Christ. So he's saying that when a fellow believer hurts you, a fellow believer offends you, a fellow believer does something to irritate you to death. You don't end the relationship. You hear that? You do not end the relationship. Here they're irritating you to death, and here's what you want to do. Stay away from them, not have anything to do with them. Severed all ties. Um... But when it's a believer, you don't really have that luxury. All they're doing is irritating you a little bit, offending you a little bit. You don't get mad. You don't get even. You show tolerance. Now, there's a parallel passage that explains this a little more in Colossians chapter 3. This is Paul's telling the Colossians basically the same thing that he's telling the Ephesians, but he builds on it a little bit more for them where he says in Colossians 3, he says, So, as those who have been chosen of God, that's the Christians, the believers, holy and beloved, part, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. And then he says, bearing with one another. That's the same thing as to bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone. He's talking about within the church family. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, what are we supposed to do? Forgive them too. So also should you. This idea of bearing with one another is basically the same thing as showing tolerance. And it means there's this willingness to endure with other believers. I'm going to endure with you. I mean, you're irritating me. You're offending me. Oh, my goodness. It's hard to, you know, you're rubbing me the wrong way. And the Bible, God says, if I'm going to walk worthy of the calling in which I've been called, God says, Ron, bear with them. Tolerate them. Oh, you got to complain about them? I tell you what, God has a lot to complain about me. I commit sin constantly. I'm irritating to God, perhaps. I don't know. And he said, just as Christ forgave you, you forgive them. We're to live with a spirit of humility and endure with other believers uh, despite differences and frustrations that we have with them. 
And remember, we're all just a pile of dust anyway, right? We're just created beings under God's power and authority. Real relationships, especially in a fellowship as diverse as a church, always requires tolerance. It always will. Guys, in a church, it's impossible for a church to grow and fulfill the mission that God wants it to fulfill without these concepts here of humility and gentleness and patience and tolerance. It's impossible for a church to grow. We've got to put up <laughs> with each other. Now, that doesn't mean tolerate sin. We're not talking about that. It doesn't mean just allow anybody in the church to do whatever they want to do. Um, but it does mean, and it doesn't mean glossing over serious differences. We, do, we have to deal with things. We still deal with them. But we do it in love and gentleness and humility and patience. And the reason why we do this is the next point that the Apostle Paul gives us because we want to we're being diligent we're being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace that's what god wants us to do we have to preserve the unity of the spirit of this church body in the bond of peace and he uses the word diligent and that means we are devoted to it we are dedicated to unity with every believer we're diligent now, Paul is not saying that all denominational organizations should be united into one big, happy church family. He's not saying that. And that's what a lot of people try to promote. It's a spiritual unity with my fellow believers, not churches, denominations. I am to have a spiritual unity with people who are genuine, born-again believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So you've heard me say plenty of times that there are denominations out there that are full of lost people. Full of them. That's not the unity we're talking about. We're talking about unity, a spiritual unity, with my Christian brothers and sisters in Christ who have been created. This unity has been created by the Holy Spirit. Uh, you already have that bond with believers, whether you know it or not. It's already there. You already have, you're already bound together with them. The, that oneness is not created by man. It can't be some ecclesiastical group getting together and talking and saying, okay, now we all want to be one together, one big happy church. Guys, that's not going to happen. What can happen is that I am at one with all my brothers and sisters in Christ. That can happen because it's a spiritual bond. It's a bond that's not created by man, but it is preserved by believers. That's what he's saying. We didn't make the bond, but we do maintain the bond by our worthy walk. So let me ask you in closing, how are you doing? How are you doing with your walk? Are you humble today? Have you been practicing humility? Do you understand that you're just a mere created being? And everything that you have is something that was given to you by someone else. God. Everything you have. So... If you have more than somebody else, don't use that as an occasion to look at somebody else and say, look at them, you know, they're so much lower than me. Don't look, use it as an occasion to look down. You ought to use it as an occasion to look up and say, thank you, God, how you've blessed me. And then help that person that might be in a lower position than you when it comes financially or even intellect. And giftedness. God knows I need a lot of help. So uh, um, how humble are you? 
gentleness. How gentle are you? That's an absence of a spirit of revenge or retaliation. You know how you know you're, you're gentle? It's how you talk to people when they pull out in front of you on the road. Now that's not, of course, that's not your fellow believers, but it is a concept of gentleness. I know a lot of people that talk a lot of trash in their car to people that can't hear them. I wonder if, they, if the person came right up to them and said something to them. You know, I'm going to tell you, I had some road, a road rage event recently. It really wasn't a road rage event. It was a gas station rage event. I was at Sam's. Has anybody been to Sam's to get gas recently? Is the line long? Yeah, and you know, there's people that will kill for a place in that line. Well, I was driving along, moseying along, driving, and I pulled in, and, and it just happened. I, I take my little ride into the Sam's, and it just happened to where I'm in a really good spot, and bam. And I was one car behind getting in. I, I feel a knock. I hear a knock at my window. I roll it down. This guy is red-faced, almost, he was so mad, he was almost crying. You took my place. I've been waiting over there for 10 minutes. You, you, what are you doing taking my place? And you know, and I didn't take his place. He was just coming in from the wrong way. And I had to decide in that split second, was I going to beat him up? Or was I going to be gentle? And, and because he was twice as big as me, <laughs> and he was mad. I mean, this guy was mad. And I said, sir, I did not mean to do that. I didn't mean to do this on purpose. I said, do you want me to move? He said, yes. yes. And I mean, and I said, okay, I'm going to move. No problem. And so I'm getting ready to put up the window. And he stepped away, and then he stopped, and he looked back at me, and he said, Bud, I'm sorry I was so mean. I just needed that, you know. And I said, no problem. You know what? The world is watching us to see if we're going to walk the way the Lord tells us to walk. And I had a little victory that time. I hope and pray we all can have those little victories throughout our life. But it's gentleness, not retaliating, not, not getting mad at people. That guy was right in my face, too. Also, patience, in, endure negative circumstances, and never give in to them. Guys, you need patience. And let me just say, in marriages, you need patience. I learned a long time ago, and Dr. Gary Chapman taught me this. He said, there's some things that your spouse is never going to change that you want them to change. They'll never change. And sometimes they will, but sometimes they won't. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Are you going to just have a horrible marriage and be mad and gripe and complain your whole life? Or are you going to be patient and endure the circumstances and never give in to them? Don't get upset. Don't lose your temper. Don't go into a rage. Marriage. Now your kids too, like that relationship with your kids, you have to be patient with them. Of course, we can whip them, you know, and take out our frustration like that. I used to do that all the time, didn't I, Hannah? I had to chase her around. It hurt her, but I was feeling good. Um, I'm kidding, sort of. <laughs> sort of. But we need to be patient with people in our marriages, with our families, uh, with our church family. And we need to be tolerant. And I'm not talking about tolerating sin and immoral behavior in the world. We, I don't tolerate that. What's going on in our world is pathetic. It's absolutely pathetic. 
And I'm not going to say one good thing about the sin that's happening in our world. But for my church family, I'm going to want to be tolerant and loving and kind and compassionate when we do things to one another that irritate each other and that we don't like. We just don't like that. Let's be tolerant to one another with that because we're all different, right? We're all different. And that's a beautiful thing in many ways. God wants us to be tolerant of one another. It's the only way that we can have a worthy walk and live, a, live have those balanced scales where our practical living matches our spiritual position. And I hope and pray that we can be a church like that so we can uh, grow together and honor our Lord Jesus Christ and reach this lost world for him. Would you pray with me? Father, we want to thank you for this day, and we want to thank you for your word. Uh, once again, I'm always very comforted by the fact that I don't have to stand up here and talk about things that I think, but I can explain your word and share your word and give the sense and the meaning of your word to your people. And I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would touch all of our hearts and that you would grow us in a way in which brings glory to you and helps our church and helps a world that so desperately needs to see a group of people that genuinely love each other, that are genuinely united that have patience and gentleness and tolerance and humility to one another. The world needs to see that. So we pray you would help. If there's somebody here today that's never trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, we pray today would be the day that they would hear and see how marvelous he is and how great he is and the great gift of eternal life he offers to all who believe just simply by faith. It's not works, it's not earned, it's not deserved, but it's a gift of grace that we get eternal life, eternal security through simple faith in Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray, amen.